Good morning. It's Thursday, the 1st of February, and this is Govind Raj Athiraj coming to you from Mumbai, India's financial capital. Yes, it is the 1st of February and would have been Union Budget Day in the previous four years, except it is interim budget day today as the union budget is announced by a new government or will be announced by the new government after elections due in April this year. So, the top stories and themes are markets are up in anticipation of a friendly interim budget. Most new investors are not buying large cap stocks. It's actually one or two digit stocks that are catching fancy. Global oil action will now be in the Atlantic basin with India expected to drive up demand in Asia. The government finally cuts import duties on components for mobile phone manufacture. The Reserve Bank of India asks Paytm to seize most transaction linked businesses by March 15. And Elon Musk's $56 billion salary from Tesla struck down by a court. This is a core report with Govindraj Athiraj. The markets gear up for a friendly budget. Well, this is an interim budget and not the big one, which will come after elections are held starting April and the results will be out in May. But if you look back this week, that is, Monday was good. Remember the 1,240-point surprise jump. Tuesday saw a lot of it being reversed and Wednesday was good again, at least sentimentally speaking. So what does one make of this? Well, it's obviously not easy because there are several factors playing, including what the Federal Reserve might or might not do and interest rate expectations in the United States and Eurozone, the tone that the interim budget for today will set ahead of general elections and which the market, of course, now expects to go in favor of the BJP or as many analysts call it, political continuity. And then the earnings or numbers for the third quarter that are coming out right now and finally capital flows. Broadly, those capital flows are weak as far as foreign portfolio investors are concerned. They've already sold more than $2.6 billion in January and steady as far as domestic capital goes. Meanwhile, earnings can cause more upsets than we would have otherwise expected or imagined, as it happened with HTFC when the markets almost suddenly decided that its deposit growth was not fast enough and then began dumping the stock. HTFC Bank, by the way, has the highest weightage in the Nifty 50 index amongst all stocks at about 13.5% and close to 30% in the Nifty Bank index, and we'll come to that shortly. On Wednesday, the Sensex rallied 613 points to end at 71,753, while the Nifty 50 closed at 21,726, up 204 points. Elsewhere in the region, Chinese indices have fallen to a five-year low despite expectations over stronger support measures by authorities, support for the stock markets, that is. Back home in general, mid-caps and small-cap indices are also holding strong despite all expectations, exhortations and suggestions something we shall once again discuss shortly. The larger expectation from the interim budget is obviously spending linked themes to the extent that the budget will provide some hints. The spending could be linked to infrastructure like highways, which has doubled in the last three years, and to rural India, around which there is much expectation. BSE sectoral gauges of industrial and capital good firms have rallied more than 70% in the last year, beating a 17% rise in the benchmark index, according to Bloomberg. Speaking of spending, Indians are spending less on pizzas and burgers going by the third quarter results of Domino's and McDonald's with revenue and profits of their franchise owners in India slowing down. All these companies had seen high consumption in the period immediately after COVID and perhaps that's also distorting the expectation or demand patterns as in many other areas and sectors. Quick service restaurant or QSR operators as they're called We're actually fighting everything, including the rising cost of cheese in specific and inflation in general by trimming costs and providing incentives, but that does not seem to be working as well as they would like. New domestic investors are bullish, but on penny stocks. Most institutional investors are now recommending that people switch their investments to large cap stocks or stocks in the BSE 100 or Nifty 50 or at least thereabouts. Now, this could be easier said because there is an interesting conundrum. Being that, while there are millions of new investors signing up every month, many of them are actually and only taking small bets and punts, which means they would rather buy stocks that are in the single or double digits, and we're talking about rupees, or at best three digits, and surely not four digits, which many large caps, like say HDFC Bank, could be. 
We will come to, as I said earlier, HDFC Bank in a moment. But the market is caught between veterans advising caution and recommending balancing investments in favor of large caps versus youngsters or newcomers who seem to be going by what they can afford rather than what is necessarily a seeming long-term bet. Now, this could, of course, play out an entire cycle and we perhaps shall meet after that cycle to discuss where the chips finally landed. Anyway, I reached out to G. Chokalingam, founder of Economics Research, and I began by first asking him what he was expecting from the interim budget, since that's what we are talking about today going into market, and then the broader trends he was seeing in the market, including in relation to these small cap buys. In my limited interaction with many investors, no one has any expectation from the budget. Everybody believes that it will be pure vote on account for two reasons. The recent Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh election results and also what has happened in Bihar has given a lot of confidence to investing community that the political stability would continue after the election in your 2024 May election. And secondly, even if you look at 2019 experience, that time also there were not many initiatives. So same thing would continue in 24 also. I firmly believe that rather the ruling party with a lot of passion and anxiety and vigor once they come back to power, they would announce a lot of measures post-election. Right. And if you were to look at the market specifically, so, you know, if you look at this week, we had a good start on Monday, down on Tuesday, pick up on Wednesday again. So what is this telling you? Yes, it's very tough for uh, people who have seen the market for more than three decades. It's simply refusing, particularly the new investors. One, even now, six to ten lakh uh, new investors are coming into the market every week. And they are lapping up the shares. And second, yes, fundamentals are very strong. You know, we saw uh, so many global institutions, including IMF, upgrading India's GDP growth for FI25. Third, anticipated political stability. So therefore, the rally is continuing, basically driven by the domestic investors. But I would still, you know, have apprehension on the market because the risk for the market comes from within the market, not from uh, political or economic factors. That's only because of, you know, the market build-up, market cap build-up, which is more than 375 lakh crore. And whenever there is a fear factor, the liquidity crisis will surge and that will see that the small and mid-cap fall extremely bad. So this is a time to be cautious. And also the global factors like post-election in Taiwan, the war of words between China and Taiwan and uh, Pakistan and Iran episode and then America making some statements on Iran, then what's happening in Israel and extending to Middle East. So this is something new. We have not seen convergence of these many events on the global political front. So therefore, though I am going wrong in anticipating severe correction of the small and mid cap, I would still, you know, suggest very, very cautious approach, 40-50% to large cap, around 15% for cash and gold, and the rest 35% for the quality small and mid cap. The board would be very safe, defensive. If at all, if there is any political, global political factors that turn very adverse, definitely the gold will rescue the investor. So this is a time to think of gold ETF. Wow. So on. Okay. So you talked about you know more than fifty percent to large caps. Now HDFC is one such large cap which clearly has disappointed. And while it may have recovered a little bit, clearly there is a lot of uncertainty, not just for HDFC but the overall financials space. How are you seeing that? I believe that it is more to do with the perception management. Once in a while, unfortunately, it happened to, you know, Maruti in the past came down to 1400. Infosys in three, four days became, you know, 30% cheaper. It happened to Nestle. It happened to so many, you know, stocks. How it is happening to HDFC also. I am not saying, denying the fact that HDFC has not, you know, to some extent failed to, you know, meet the expectation. There is no doubt. But there was no sudden, unexpected, uh, steep fall in the performance. It was a marginal uh, deviation from the expectations. And uh, the bank, which used to trade at uh, four and a half times price to book value, now it has come down below three times price to adjusted book value. I believe that it is very appealing buy. But still, why the stocks are falling? For two reasons. The very short term now, the FIs are not buying, you know, they are rather net seller. And second, as I mentioned, Last three and a half years, nearly 10 pro new investors have come. You can't prove it, but in my limited interaction with many of them, nobody wants to buy large cap stocks and nobody wants to buy if any stock price is in three digits or four digits. You know, they don't look at the funda, but 
they love if any stock is in single digit or then second preference in double digit. So therefore, there is no taker for stock like HDFC, but I firmly believe that I do not own personally, but I firmly believe that this is an exciting time for the medium to long-term investors to buy HDFC back because it has a 53% of the branches in rural and semi-urban. I believe that is a, going to be the next growth engine for the banking sector because urban centers are crowded. Everybody has a bank account almost in urban life. So HGMC Bank would definitely continue to maintain 18% profit growth. Right. Anyway, so I was using HDFCs in illustration because it has a 35% plus weightage in the Sensex. But the other question and the last question, Choka, is to do with earnings. I mean, that also is obviously driving and causing uncertainty. You know, for example, we saw earnings from Bajaj Finance. We saw earnings from Reliance itself. We've seen earnings from and many companies and a few more to come. At this point, what is your overall takeaway? Yeah, earning growth is not going to be great because IT sector is growing in a poor single digit. As you mentioned, some of the companies, because of the larger base, they are not able to maintain the kind of growth. And that is getting repeated in the small and mid cap also. There are many stocks, you know, there are many small cap companies posting one rupee EPS, but the stock is trading at 60, 70 PE. So there is little disappointment. Uh, so that's why, you know, apart from the asset allocation in favor of, you know, very conservative approach to large cap gold ETF cash, one should also have stock-specific approach because though the market is rising, if you see last one week, something which is very interesting to observe, the number of declines also quite heavy. You know, it may be less than number of advances. So it's happening. A lot of profit booking is happening in the overvalued small and mid-cap stocks and the large mid-cap as well. So this is a time to, you know, be extremely cautious and prune your portfolio by selling off overvalued small and mid-cap stocks. Even if it is a large cap, overvalued, you should sell it off. Choka, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. My pleasure. What happens after Saudi Arabia's move to hold capacity hikes? Our energy segment today is brought to you by the India Energy Week. On Wednesday, we spoke of Saudi Aramco's holding back a plan to boost its oil capacity, a move that shocked the oil world, also because of the accompanying announcements of a switch to natural gas, chemicals and renewables with all those saved funds. Bloomberg reported that the world's biggest oil exporter had said just in November that it was progressing very well with a multi-billion dollar project to boost capacity and to 13 million barrels a day by 2027 as demand in China and India was expected to grow. Saudi Arabia currently has a capacity for about 12 million barrels a day and is producing much less at about 9 million barrels a day after it curbed output as part of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries plus efforts to revive the global oil market and prevent a surplus. And when I say revive from the Saudi Arabian point of view, it obviously means hold or increase prices. Reuters has later reported, quoting sources, that price management is the priority for 2024 and 25 for the Saudis, and this was a deferral and would likely resume at a later date, according to that source, adding that this has no bearing on the view of long-term demand. And obviously, that means fossil fuels. So the question is, what does Saudi Arabia's pulling back production mean? And what is the overall outlook for demand and supply of oil in coming months, and particularly demand? Remember, all of this affects India because we're seeing several factors at play, as will be clear shortly. At the base level, there is, of course, the price of crude. Second, also the price that the refined products from Indian refineries command and at what price they're finally sold. Reliance, for example, exports most of its output. I reached out to Victor Katona, lead crude analyst at Vienna-based trade intelligence firm Kepler, and I began by asking him what he was taking away from Saudi Arabia's announcement. Well, it ultimately depends on the perspective of how you look into things. For someone, the glass is half empty. These people actually believe that demand worldwide for crude is looking much worse than Saudi Ramco initially anticipated, and that's why they are cutting their long-term production capacity targets. For someone, the glass is half full. For instance, for these people, uh, they understand that OPEC Plus will be around for many, many years to come. And it just makes no sense to invest uh, such a huge amount of money into production levels that will not be reached at any time soon. I mean, ultimately, the point of OPEC Plus is to uh, coordinate and, and the line on production levels that are below production capacity uh, maximums. So effectively, everyone cuts something. 
And Saudi Arabia has been cutting quite substantially, even with a production target of 12 million, which is now the new normal production target. Again, Saudi Arabia still has 3 million barrels per day that it can bring into the market anytime soon. And that's a tremendous amount. It's by far the largest spare capacity that anyone has. So I think both perspectives are correct. Both are true. Oil demand will not be growing as quickly so as to you know, have five, six billion dollars spent every year into additional investments in Saudi Arabia and upstream. But at the same time, it's also a testament to how strong the OPEC plus cooperation actually has been. And the Saudi Arabia understands and appreciates that. Right. And they're also saying, just to spend a minute more on this, that they want to move this fund or move these funds away from, you know, producing oil to doing other things like natural gas, chemicals, renewables, more importantly. Absolutely. Especially natural gas is really important for Saudi Arabia. We shouldn't forget that Saudi Arabia is a huge oil producer, but a lot of that oil is effectively wasted in things like burning crude for power generation. Saudi Arabia is by far the largest crude burn element in the entire universe, right? They are burning six, 700,000 barrels per day of crude just for electricity, one tanker a day. Imagine if you could actually sell this. And the only solution to this is to maximize natural gas production and have power generation built on natural gas. So I think that's a very wise move because in as much as they are increasing the amount of natural gas within the country, they're also setting free huge amounts of crude that could be exported anytime, anywhere, for a hefty sum, of course. Right. Okay, so that's Saudi Arabia. Now, what's happening in a broader global sense when it comes to production, particularly the United States, Guyana, all the other countries? OPEC's supply growth has been largely non-existent in 2023. So really, the supply growth that we have been seeing over the past couple of months is coming from non-OPEC countries. The United States was the bigger engine of growth over the past couple of years. I think that's slowly tapering. 2024 will be pretty much the last year when the United States still has substantial increases. And from 2025, it starts to plateau. Guyana, Brazil, and especially at later stages, Namibia, will be the growth stories of the future. All of that will be in the Atlantic Basin. All of that is largely just one geological structure just shared by these countries as the two continents ripped apart. And that is the future of upstream. It's deep water Atlantic basin. Of course, this is not enough to mitigate uh, you know, the, the actual increase in global demand. So OPEC plus will be bringing back crude over the course of the upcoming years. But it will be also mitigated by the fact that you have very, very nice resources, still abundant crude resources across the universe that have been largely untapped. But the United States is no longer a big story for the future. The United States will largely taper off. And it's the small countries that actually want oil, they don't shy away from it. They don't have financing bans and they don't have an ESG constraints that the Western universe has that will be very much driving that growth in the future. Right. And the other big question is demand. Demand clearly seems to be the driving factor for keeping prices where they are right now, despite the Middle Eastern tensions, despite all the other production issues that we've been just talking about. So where do you see that in the near to medium future? I think the, in the immediate future, demand seems to be weak. China doesn't really impress the things that have been happening in China, especially the property sector collapse of the past couple of weeks. I think that's a, that's a huge potential danger to diesel consumption and as a consequence to Chinese demand. In general, the Atlantic Basin is weak and we expect that the U.S. growth should at some point slow down to the point of either, either no growth at all, so basically 0% year-in-year GDP growth, or a mild recession. Europe will be in a recession one way or another. And I think this will all boil down into a weak first half of 2024. I think the second half of 2024 is significantly better. Asia will start to pick up. India will be very, very strong again this year. and might even surprise people to actually how strong it actually can get and lifting the overarching sentiment across the continent. And by that point, by the end of 2024, even tiny bits and pieces of the Atlantic Basin might join Asia in the sense that they actually feel bullish and not bearish for the first time in two years. What are the indicators or metrics that you are tracking right now in the middle of all of this, which you obviously feel are important and deserve a close look? I think one of the key metrics are the flows between separate trading regions. Because Asia and the Middle East right now seems to be one united region when it comes to flows. The distances aren't really far away. The logistic costs are fairly manageable. So Asian consumers of oil 
tend to focus on the Middle East for their procurement, basically bringing anything from Europe or from the United States across the Cape of Good Hope. It just doesn't make any sense. It's, it's too expensive. So kind of you have two regions, the Atlantic Basin region and the Asian region, which also includes the Middle East, they kind of tend to focus on themselves and don't really talk to one another because the arbitrage from one into another and vice versa doesn't really work. You can see that also with Indian diesel. Indian diesel was a big thing into Europe. India was the largest supplier, all-time highs in December 2023. The Red Sea disruptions hit Indian diesel to Europe dropped 80% in just one month. The only explanation for this is the fact that the logistics, the high freight costs, are killing the arbitrage into Europe, into the Atlantic Basin. So there'll be more Asia talking to one another, trading with one another, and the same will happen with Europe and the United States as well in the Atlantic Basin. So kind of two separate regions that we need to focus on. Victor, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much. This was the energy segment supported by India Energy Week. For more details, log on to www.indiaenergyweek.com. India cuts import duties on electronic components, finally. India has finally cut import duties on some parts used in making mobile phones to 10% from 15%, a move that will benefit companies like Apple who export or export large parts of their production. Meanwhile, import duties on parts such as battery covers, main camera lenses, back covers, other mechanical items of plastic and metal, GSM antenna and other parts has been reduced to 10%. The finance ministry said in a notification late on Tuesday and reported by Reuters. Meanwhile, the import duty on inputs used to manufacture these components has been cut to zero, the notification said. As a background, duties on mobile phone parts were the highest amongst six comparable manufacturing nations, including China, Vietnam, Mexico and Thailand, making manufacturing and export from India uncompetitive. To make a phone in India for exports, as we are and Apple is and would like to do more of them, many parts have to come from outside India. Having high import duties on them has been therefore self-defeating. Paytm barred from taking fresh deposits and credit transactions. The Reserve Bank of India on Wednesday restricted Paytm Payments Bank Limited from fresh deposits and credit transactions across its services due to supervisory concerns, according to a release late Wednesday. The circular's reading is quite strong though, putting March 15th as an outer deadline for seizing all services under this entity. An audit report revealed persistent non-compliances and continued material supervisory concerns in the bank warranting further supervisory action, the Reserve Bank said in that release, though it did not disclose further details. The Reserve Bank of India did say that customers could withdraw or utilize their balances without restrictions, but Paytm's nodal accounts would be terminated by the 29th of February which means all connected services, including wallets, fast tags, national common mobility cards, or any prepaid instruments and so on, would cease to operate. It's not clear to me, since I don't track this company in any sense, what other businesses it has in a revenue earning sense, at least for this entity, which are not linked to the above. I'm sure there must be, but I'm sure other analysts would figure it out. But as a customer, obviously, you should cease to transact and get refunds for any money in the pipeline. And I'm also reckoning this is bad news for the stock when it opens today. Musk salary struck down. Speaking of bad news, in some international and Elon Musk news, a Delaware judge struck down Elon Musk's $55 billion pay package at Tesla after finding the process for securing its approval deeply flawed. A major setback for the CEO of the world's most valuable auto company, the Wall Street Journal reported. The decision issued on Tuesday in the Delaware Court of Chancery calls into question how Tesla's board plans to accommodate or rather compensate Musk, a serial entrepreneur with an array of other business interests. It also raises questions of whether his ties to his board are too close and puts greater attention on Musk's personal wealth. Musk doesn't accept a salary from Tesla and while in recent years he has ranked as the world's richest person, most of his assets are tied up in the shares of his companies, said Wall Street Journal. Tesla is a publicly traded company, is a financial pillar of his business empire and he is also borrowed against his stake in the electric car maker. The ruling means that Tesla will have to come up with a new compensation package for 
Elon Musk, who has been pushing for greater control over Tesla, where he is the largest shareholder with 13% ownership. And the Wall Street Journal quoted him saying that he felt uncomfortable transforming Tesla into a leader in artificial intelligence and robotics without controlling around 25% of the company. And before I go, the IATA, or the International Air Transport Association, has said that recovery in air travel continued in December 23, and all of 2023 traffic edged even closer to matching the pre-pandemic demand. Total traffic in 2023 rose almost 37% compared to 2022, and this was mostly led by Asia. And globally, full-year 2023 traffic was at about 94% of pre-pandemic levels. And pre-pandemic levels is 2019. So I guess the important thing to note is that while traffic is rising, we are still a little short of what the pre-pandemic peak was. International traffic in 2023 was up 41% versus 2022. And domestic traffic for 2023 rose 30% compared to the previous year. On that note, that's it from me for today. See you tomorrow with a special budget analysis edition. That was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopses or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core.in. And thank you once again for listening.